morning, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us for our fourth TechRec speaker series. This one's focused on defining and growing your career in data. Just to give you a little bit of background in terms of why we decided to do these speaker series and one of the, the key focuses for us here at TechRec. So one of our core missions is to really add value and contribute to the tech tech community here in Toronto. Now, we work in a couple of core specialisms, data development and product, and then each month we, we sort of switch in between each, right? So last month, uh, you know, we, we did a little bit on development roles. This month, we're gonna talk really about defining and growing your career from a great data perspective. You know, we've got a great lineup of speakers joining us here tonight. So Shreyas Becker is from Santa Fe. He'll be discussing the skills you need to acquire during your data career to become more senior and more sophisticated within your firm. Uh, Lindsay Murphy from Sakota, she'll be sharing insights into the journey to people management or going down more of an individual contributor path. And then lastly, Anthony Patrick, me and him will, from Paystone, will be having a conversation um, just about building out your data teams and how you transition in and out of data career. Now, before we bring uh, Shreyas on, I would like to bring your attention to our next event that we're going to be hosting, um, you know, in a month. It's going to be uh, late June and we're doing sort of a women in technology event. So we've got a great panel of speakers from Google, One Password, Ada, who will be sharing a little bit about their experiences and their journey, um, you know, as a woman in, in the technology field. Now, without further ado, I would like to introduce you to Shreyas Beckers. He's made um, you know, major steps within his career in the consulting side. So he started with PwC before moving to Boston uh, Consulting Group, which is one of the, the most sophisticated consulting firms globally. Um, you know, after that, he transitioned into a fintech career with Neo Financial, building out uh, various data products. Currently at San Jose, is one of the world's largest pharmaceutical companies. He's specializing in the development of AI and data products within the pharma um, field. I believe he's as well. He's also an angel investor. So without further ado, I'd like to bring, you know, Shreyas up on stage and share a little bit of his presentation uh, forward. Second. Okay. Perfect. Shreyas made it okay. to the stage. Let me bring up your presentation and uh, I'll head off. Enjoy. Hey, perfect. Hey, thanks, folks. Uh, appreciate you listening in at uh, 6 p.m. on a Thursday to me. Uh, I, I hope I bring some value. Uh, and thanks, Daniel, for setting this up. So, you know, one of the most common things that most people in data science, you know, once they spend two or three years in the career, you know, they ask is, hey, like, what is like, you know, like you're a data scientist, then what, like a senior data scientist? And, and, and like, you know, like there's always this question on, okay, what is a data scientist? What is a senior data scientist? What is a lead data scientist? And how that career actually progression happens? Uh, you know, like uh, I've spent some time uh, leading teams. Uh, so uh, I, I think... Uh, have a perspective in which you know like some of you uh, might uh, find valuable so that's what this presentation is uh, largely going to be about so regardless of which data science manager you uh, talk to you know the most people are going to say is a very very broad statement like the best data scientists are the ones who focus on impact and you know they are like always try to a business value uh, or a business metric uh, but but if you are like starting out as a data scientist, it really doesn't help a statement like this saying go find value or uh, you know like th these are like a bunch of tickets that you need to like solve for. They they're not uh, set up for I believe at least I believe uh, for you know the core skill sets or you know like help people move across you know uh, like defined uh, swim lanes uh, so to speak. So. I, I thought of like okay let, let's break down you know into like more specifically than just say like add value or whatever you know like what exactly data science is all about at the core of it uh, you know when you think about it uh, data science or data scientist uh, needs to master five skill sets 
uh, you know, the first and the most important thing I believe is problem formulation. You know, this is truly understanding what problem you are trying to solve. You know, and sometimes it could be uh, in a business context. Sometimes it could be, uh, you know, more of a research and development type of fo focused. So, so knowing exactly the problem that you are trying to solve and having a scientific approach to solving the problem is very critical. And when I say scientific approach, what I mean is uh, having a hypothesis driven approach. Uh, you know not doing science to just do science but like have a hypothesis go like hey like if these two metrics are going to vary maybe revenue is going to get impacted you know like create like a set of hypotheses and then like start testing them out uh, systematically uh, before f figuring out which one actually needs to go into your product so that's like i believe the most basic thing that you know like most data scientists should kind of figure out is like the problem formulation the next one is you need to have the ability to test these hypotheses. You know, that kind of comes down to the technical ability. Uh, you know, uh, you know, like when, when I first started out, it was just like on SQL and R that was basically like the tool set that we had, uh, you know, then it slowly became Hive and then like, you know, uh, now like you have like an entire data tech stack, you know, with like 60, 70 tools in it. So not everyone obviously needs to know all the tools, uh, but having the tool set to do the problem is I believe to like follow through with the hypothesis is very, very critical. Uh, so I think, you know, developing the technical ability is another thing that, you know, you need to like kind of always be on the lookout for. The third thing is the analytical ability. Uh, and when we say analytical ability, it's mostly in, in the next, it, it's kind of like the one that is going to like set the stage for the next piece, which is like, how do you actually like communicate it? Uh, analytics helps you, I believe analytical thinking helps you to like structure your thinking a lot more, you know, give having a hypothesis is great, but like trying to like put them together in form of a story or trying to put them together in form of a user experience on a, if it's an actual product that you are building. So all of those things uh, are very, very critical. That's what I think is analytical ability. The next thing is synthesize, you know, synthesize Synthesis is basically just having the ability to interpret the results. Uh, you know, like there is a lot of noise these days around what something means something, you know, like, you know, when, when we first started, the, one of the things that everyone spoke about was uh, what is correlation, what is causation and stuff like that. But now, uh, you know, with, with the advancements in technology, uh, it's so hard to even in many cases, understand what the model is trying to say, how to read it, how to interpret it in the, in, in the form of a, a workbench of a user or a typical user. So having that ability to synthesize is absolutely critical. And the last thing is influence. You know, influence, uh, I mean, you know, influence can form take many shapes. Uh, you know, the, some of the more common ones for analysts uh, kind of come under the thing of like, you know, building a very strong story. Uh, but then uh, increasingly, we are also looking at like, how do you influence uh, your uh, model to become perhaps an API that you could perhaps deploy on a product and then like if you start having that type of influence you are starting to have uh, enter, like how the entire tech stack of the customer facing product impacts so you no know, like having that influence to bring different groups together to actually get value out of the data so very critical I, I, I believe these are like the five kind of like things uh, dimensions so to speak you know so it's not just thinking about value like like value is more like the outcome but I believe like the these are like the building blocks that lead to like moving from uh, value to data. And these are like things that I believe most data scientists should uh, kind of like think about their skill sets uh, and benchmark across these dimensions. And so that those are the dimensions. So now let's, I will get back to these dimensions in, in some time, but let's just think about how a role of a data scientist could grow. Uh, within an organization, you know, I think the first and the most important piece is on the execution part. Uh, when I say execution, it is the ability to like, you know, take a problem and drive it and find either insights out of it or build products that or, or build those models that could go on to a front user facing product. Uh, so that's the piece of execution, you know, it's a very entry level uh, kind of like skill set, but very, very important, you know, like taking the problem and driving it to completion, uh, you know, but when the next stage you see is like independence, you know, when I see independence, you know, I, what I mean by independence is this person would have like a little bit more autonomy to think of, oh, what if I bring this model into to solve this problem? Or what if I do that? Oh, I read this paper. What if I try that methodology here? So you would kind of like see, you, you know, like a data science 
scientists maybe like maybe like a year in their career year and a half in their career you know like a lot of the focus is going to be around not just problem solving but the specific methodology in which they are going to solve that problem uh, so i i've kind of feel like that's a very natural transition that happens in a lot of data scientists once they play around with a lot of those different techniques you see them becoming like thought leaders in their space uh, you know the one of the very interesting thing like i you know like there is a lot of debate in the literature around whether you become a thought leader or domain leader so i'll, I'll like explain what i mean by the different things like, data scientists in their career of like say one two to two years to three years or two years to four years they played a lot with like the various techniques so the first thing that they kind of brand themselves to be experts at is the technique itself uh, more than the problem space uh, and that also kind of makes sense because they have not explored the problem space fully for instance you know when you think of supply chain for instance you know it, it's a very huge problem space you know but they might have solved for one specific thing on route optimization but they would have tried tested and tried a whole variety of algorithms that f- fit into route optimization so you would or maybe take an example of anti money laundering you know like they would have picked one area of anti money laundering and they would have tested out all different techniques that would help them become really good at that so you you would see them become like thought leader and and then as they and and then at that stage what would theoretically in, in most cases happen is like you know their people around them start noticing that oh this guy is or this girl is like solving a problem really really well why don't we give this person more problems in the same area so you know uh, maybe they'll start giving this person or giving this team like more uh, problems related to maybe supply chain or fraud or whatever the area may be and then they'll slowly start becoming domain leaders and then once you start solving for those domains the next thing that happens is like you know that like a company does not exist in isolation uh, you know like there are always like connected domains for instance if you run a great marketing campaign things are going to sell out faster so running a great marketing campaign is going to impact how you manage inventory so making having that ability to make those connections is what will tr- make someone move from a domain leader to multi domain leader and then thinking about it as a product as a whole you know when you think of product as a whole in in my life today it's like you know it's like a specific drug that sanofi could make you know it could be for an insulin drug or some kind of drug so like how do you like maximize the value out of that product both for the customer as well as for the company so that kind of is what happened and then the last thing is of course like oh there are multiple products now so you kind of you know in some way become like a company leader so so that's in in many ways is how uh, uh i've seen noticed uh people career growth could uh, happen of course like this this would take decades for someone to move from you know execution to company leader uh, but but you know like having that light or like viewpoint m- might help uh, so let's put the five dimensions in context to the typical career growth that you know you would expect people to have you know some someone very early in their career uh, you know uh, you kind of see them you know very very like project focused uh, and then they would like if you are like a manager leading teams you know like you would immediately try to like you know if i am a manager i would try to like fit them into like okay which domain these people typically fall into i split by early to mid career and mid to late career because like i myself probably somewhere in mid to late career uh and i i typically like manage probably people in like level 1 to level 3 and level 4 so in 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 these levels uh you know like like they are not really expect expert on anything uh b- but they know how to like pull in like the different groups to become like a really really good person to solve that problem you know for instance the way to read this table is data scientists at the earliest stage of the career uh, you know as every time their greatest impact is going to be at a project level on execution you know they're not going to own the demand, de- domain but then the more senior they become the more uh, they kind of like start to own the space so to speak uh, so if you are a manager and if you see someone you know like in le- maybe level 2 the easiest way to like kind of help them move to level 3 is like start thinking of like maybe like putting them across in a chart like this and go like 
okay like you know perhaps like synthesis they need a little bit of help what needs to happen to like make them more independent in the synthesis domain or what happens to make them more independent on like influence like you no know, do i need to like start coaching them on presence do i need to start coaching them on how to make persuasive presentation or any of those things you know the first thing of course they will become really really good at is like writing code so the technology piece is usually sort of taken care of uh, but then like even like some senior data scientists you know i've seen that they struggle with actually formulating the problem uh, so you know if you have like you know like start looking at these lenses into people and like trying to figure out how to help them you could figure out exactly where you know they need help and you could like start coaching them in those areas uh, so it's very uh, simple uh, framework uh, i have used it i have found it useful i don't know if you will find it useful but i wanted to just share it to put it out there to go like th this is a framework that i try to use uh, when i am hiring people or when i am like talking to data scientists on the team and like trying to help them coach and improve so that that's where it is but, but then the next piece is like you know when you have a larger team it's it's good to have like a one one like i know a view like this into a single person but to actually like you know grow like the data iq of your entire team and like i'm not selling the software data iq but like there's like intelligence questions on data on your team you need to have more of a structured product so this or a structured process program so to speak across your team again this is something that i do and i find that works for me so i just wanted to share it here with the team and uh, and see what they think about it you know uh, so the first thing that i do you know is like have like sessions uh, you know with uh, you know like direct reports like help them set their goal like you know like hey there are a bunch of axes that we are looking at uh, where do you fall in these axes you know and and like you know we also try to like go like okay like this is these are areas that you know like both of us together believe we need to improve uh, and the most important thing at this stage is you not only identify the gap but you also make it absolutely clear that if you grow on this axis uh, this is going to be the benefit you know it could be like maybe a promotion or it could be a, a pay raise or like it could be greater projects uh, or it could be like leading bigger teams it could be any of those but but make the benefit absolutely clear otherwise i have found that you know it's difficult to like sustain the momentum through the process so make the benefit absolutely clear right at the start don't just highlight the gap but highlight the gap with the benefit once you do that once you have like a view of that nature i think it's important to like provide opportunity for these people uh, to work on uh, one of the things i have found is you know if you pick someone you know like very early in their career you can give them you know like opportunities in the area of weakness to improve but as someone has like spent some time in their career there is no point to like focus on their weakness because like they have done well without for focusing on their weakness so i typically found what works is like help them double down on their strengths you know if they are great technically like give them great technically difficult problems if they are great convincing people to like get budgets or like for their dream projects like help them more on the influence axis so then they also start to enjoy their work a lot more because they start seeing success because you know the later you get in your career the time to announce a win so to speak is increasing because you know if you are just running at a project level you know maybe like two or three insights here and there is a win uh, but then later in the career it takes like months and months of hard work to like actually like go like okay i, I think i did something meaningful so for late career individuals i think the focus has to be more on just for recommend the recommendation at least from my side is to just focus on their area of strength and not on the weakness and the third is the accountability partner you know like it's very similar to how when you know what happens when you try to go to a gym for instance so uh, you know like you you kind of like show up at the gym much more often if you have an accountability partner you know very similar to that have set up like accountability partner you know they don't always want to just listen to their manager they want to listen to someone who's going through a very similar journey to improve themselves to find a way to like deliver greater value to the organization and then, like one of the rules that i kind of like try to like push uh, for people to use on those sessions is you know put yourself on the shoe of the next person and go like what you would do if you were them you know it so it kind of like removes any judgment but rather provides uh, a view on like okay maybe just a different point of view versus saying what you are doing is wrong or what you are doing is right so it's not a evaluative session at all it's just to go like hey like maybe you should, have you tried this have you tried that or if i was you this is what i would do uh, so it, it generates a good discussion on both sides uh, and also like eliminates uh, judgment uh, as well so so i found that work 
uh, and then the fourth thing is here is tracking you know like he, here's where you gotta like put on your leader hat on and like ensure people are trending towards their goals uh and that's the thing and, and then the last thing is like very important in a individual level is if this individual actually delivers on their promise you know like very important that you deliver yours because if you don't do that the next person you, you can't really put them like you, you've lost credibility to put the next person through the program uh, or a, a process of this nature so like you know like ensure that you deliver what you promised you know in, in like like it's very difficult to decide when today's environment uh, in general uh, or in you know in, in large organizations but you know if the person actually delivers uh, against their promises you know like it's very important you know as a leader that you deliver against your promise and then the last one is like change management you know as like we've spoken earlier like most of us uh, you know probably on today's panel have like really large teams uh, so you know you need to think about setting up a process as a whole uh, you know like okay now how do I set up as a program the easiest way to do it is like not to like enforce like 30 rules or 40 rules but but I'll just make an example out of a person who succeeded in this uh, process so the more the more examples that you create the more you know people would want to do it within your teams and I've actually had instances where people in other teams also want to like put programs like this uh, happen so that's a view on like how to like design some programs uh, and then the last slide uh, is more on like what are the lessons you know all of these are like the process and all of these are great but but the mindset uh, you know as a manager like always needs to kind of go to like hey like I know the best data scientists are experts at their field they always have a growth mindset and they, they want to be autonomous and they're relentless about solving the problem that they have taken so very very important to remember in terms of like having like a at least that's what I believe in terms of having like an orientation for all of the different group parts that we are looking at here. Uh, you know, you want experts, you want people with growth mindset, and you want people who are both autonomous and relentless. And the last piece is like, you know, like you know, this process to put them anyone through this process, it's, it's going to take some time. Uh, and uh, so, you know, like always focus on rewarding efforts, like, like, you know, like put the outcome like a little bit behind if you could, and just focus on the effort you know like is the person putting the effort towards uh you know identifying the problem areas working on them uh and delivering more value as long as the efforts are there keep the encouragement going and keep rewarding the effort and then like the whatever the process you find of kind of figure out there are going to be like gaps in your processes so it makes sense to like you know finding ways to like perfect your processes and at the end of the day there's a people problem and hr teams have been handling people really really well for like centuries perhaps so make them your partners get them along in the journey and i think like you will create success for everybody involved so yeah that's about it i mean that some lessons that i've learned uh, uh Mm, and, and I'll stop here for questions or, you know, how, how Daniel guides me from here. Perfect. Well, thanks so much for, for sharing. We, we really enjoyed sort of that insight. We did have a question come in from the audience. So we, we don't have that much time, but I just wanted to maybe highlight it early on. And I, I think maybe where they're coming from is, is really about gaining that influence and becoming a thought leader. Do you have maybe a specific example from your career where you thought, okay, I've gone and, and I was really influ able to influence my seniors and maybe what did you do in, in that instance strategically to be so successful? Mm -hmm. I think the most important thing, uh, especially like, I think the question you asked was from thought leader to like a domain leader, I believe, like, can you like show me the ones? Thought leader to gain influence from the firm. I, I think it's very easy to dismiss thought leaders in a firm because thought leaders are not like driving value. They don't understand how it fits into the overall business process. So if you think you are a thought leader, uh, I think the thing to like figure out how to gain influence is like bringing all the people, like having conversations with them. This is where thinking of like, hey, like these are five dimensions to improve. And then you go like, okay, the fifth dimension is perhaps where I need to focus on an influence. And then in influence, you know, like it becomes like, what are all the different viewpoints? How do I align the various viewpoints for a common goal? Like, you know, if you could think about it in a very like emotionless manner, so to speak, then you can like very quickly like figure out how to like influence people because everybody has a goal and like it's, it then becomes about like lining up everybody's incentive to the overall business objective so so i would i would say that is probably like a way to become a influencer 
Okay, awesome. Well, Shreyas, really appreciate you taking time out of this Thursday. It was really great having you coming on board and, and sharing your insights. Um, that'll be pretty much be it for, for us today. So thanks again, and uh, I'll, I'll take you off stage now. Thank you. Perfect. Next up, we're going to have Lindsay Murphy uh, giving a quick presentation about transitioning into becoming either a people leader or as an individual contributor. Lindsay, um, you know, has really developed her career within the Toronto startup space. She, you know, was a director of BI at Benchsci. She was the head of uh, data and analytics over at Get Maple, um, and now currently the head of data at uh, Sakoda. She's also one of the key organizers of the Toronto Modern Data Stack event um, that sort of happens bi-monthly. You know, if you haven't heard of it on, on Meetup or if you haven't checked it out, I'd highly um, I'd highly encourage everyone to check it out. They run these great in-person events. So without further ado, I'm gonna bring Lindsay on stage and uh, you know, share up her presentation. Thanks, I appeared a little early. Hello, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> no worries, I'll leave, it, I'll leave you to it. Sounds good, thanks. I'll just plug the Toronto Modern Data Stack in the uh, chat. So if you're ever interested in joining us, um, we, do, we try to do events every month. So would love to see you at one. Uh, awesome. So excited to dive into this topic. Thanks so much for joining the event. Um, so my topic is called individual contributor versus people manager and how do you want to think about choosing a path in data. Uh, so as uh, Daniel said, my name is Lindsay. I am the head of data at Sakoda, and I've been in the data and analytics industry for about 11 years now. Um, and I was a formal people manager for about five years. So um, I'm really excited to talk, talk about this topic because I feel like my transition to people management wasn't really um, as smooth as maybe I thought it might be. And so I think um, having really strong leaders in data is important. And I think if we talk a little bit more candidly about some of the expectations versus reality that there is around people management, we might help make that transition for people a little bit easier. And we might be able to convince more people to become people managers. Uh, just a quick blurb on Sakota. So I joined Sakota a few weeks ago and i um, really enjoying it so far. And the company, uh, our, our title actually stands for Searchable Company Data. Um, so if you're working on self-serve analytics at your company or anything like that, enabling um, data consumers to use um, uh, data products, I highly suggest you check out our product. Um, it essentially allows uh, connection to all of your data uh, tech stack, and then you can actually search those assets either as a data team or as a non-technical user. So check it out. Um, a quick outline on my talk tonight. So we're going to go back in time and talk a little bit about the history of the data industry and some of the growth that there has been and how this has kind of impacted some of the options for career paths that data people have. I'll talk a little bit about the transition to people management and some of the things that I, I think I wish I knew before I got into people management and how I think um, kind of aligning expectations and reality can make this transition a bit easier on folks. We'll talk a bit about how you might want to think about choosing a path for you and what might be right for you. And then I'll just close things off by giving a quick few points of advice that I, I wish things that I had known about before I started that I think might help. Um, so if we go all the way back to 2012, a very long time ago, um, the data, the big data landscape, as it was called um, back then, was started. This uh, visual was started by an individual named Matt Turk. He still does this uh, today, but if there uh, a lot of the, the tools that you might see on this slide are actually probably things that either have died or we don't really use them anymore. Um, but the biggest change between what I think we're in the state of now versus what was 2012 is that the people who were using analytics, so that might be you know statisticians, analysts, data scientists, were really far removed in most cases from the people who were building the data infrastructure. So oftentimes you would have IT teams or um, architects who would be building the data warehouse and, and making BI solutions. And then you'd have analysts over here. And that was kind of the reality for me. I was using tools like SQL and I was using Excel, but I was really far removed from like, how does the data actually get in the warehouse? And, and somebody made it happen and I didn't really care too much about how that happened. <laughs> Um, and if we think back to 2012, uh, this was when kind of there was this explosion of data starting to happen. So we had the start of social networking, we had smartphones really kind of becoming uh, in the forefront. And we started to hear about this job called the data scientist. And so before this, this title wasn't really very well known or really wasn't coined at all. And not only was it now a job title, it was also being called the sexiest job of the 21st century. 
And uh, we also were starting to see that businesses were figuring out, you know, I can make money from data and this can turn into a really big revenue generating opportunity. And we started to see headlines like this, where, you know, data scientists were starting to figure out and predict things that maybe people knew even before maybe their father or they did. Um, and so in, in 2012, this was also when cloud data warehouses were starting to, to come out into the market. And so um, Google BigQuery, Redshift and uh, Snowflake all launched around the same time. And they hadn't really picked up pace yet, but they were starting to kind of lay the groundwork for where we are today. If we fast forward to 2019, this is still the same individual making this chart and the chart looked really different. Um, 2019 was now filled with much more uh, data landscape here and a lot more logos and just different areas that people were focused in. And now we had a new title for the sexiest job. So we found that data engineers were spending, you know, 90% of their time cleaning data and not very much time building predictive models. And so data engineers started to get a lot more credit for, you know, moving data around and, and building data infrastructure where previously it used to be more of like an IT function. And the modern data stack, while it didn't start in 2019, it had been around kind of getting some, uh, uh, gaining some traction, sorry, before 2019, this was really when things started to sort of hit this like hype cycle that we're in right now, where you see DBT, everybody's talking about DBT in the analytics industry. Um, and a lot of these vendors are coming out all surrounding the modern data stack. And this uh, now into 2012, 2023 into this year is the, the new data landscape. It's almost impossible to see all the logos on here. It's kind of ridiculous that they're still doing it. And there's a whole new section now for machine learning and artificial intelligence. And now we have another new sexiest title. The analytics engineers have taken over the sexiest title. And while the world is probably tired of hearing about how sexy we are in our data roles, um, it does kind of create some, some new ground for a lot of these different roles. So data scientists really didn't exist more than 10 or 12 years ago. Data engineers and analytics engineers are relatively new titles. And so uh, what this means is that oftentimes when roles are new, there's less of a career path really to take advantage of because they're brand new. We're still figuring out, you know, what's next, where does somebody go? However, um, as Shrey has mentioned in, in his talk that data scientists, for example, are now starting to get more technical. There's a lot more tools out there for them to take advantage of. And we're seeing that on the same, uh, same vein with analytics engineers and data engineers, that these roles are now you know, that IT function is not as far removed. We're actually now taking over a lot of the uh, building of infrastructure and uh, it's allowing us to have uh, more technical individuals in data roles. And with that comes the ability to start working more like software engineers. And so software engineering has been around for years and has a very long career path. And so as data folks, we can actually now start to think about how would our career path look similar to an engineering career path. And so uh, oftentimes folks will start out in a junior engineering role and work their way up to, uh, you know, a, a, maybe a senior level and then have to decide, do I want to go down the technical track or do I want to move into a managerial role? And my career looked pretty similar to this. So uh, I started out in individual contributor roles and I worked my way up into uh, an analytics manager role where I wasn't really a people manager, but I managed a function at my company. And uh, from that role, I moved into a director role where I started um, managing a team. And uh, this transition, while it looks pretty innocent on the slide, is actually was really a big change for me. So I felt, you know, in my analytics manager role, I was kind of at the top of my game. I was really feeling like, you know, I, I knew my stuff really well. And I was the subject matter expert at my company. And then seemingly overnight, um, I started to feel like this when I went into the director role. I was really, from one day to the next, started to, you know, have to develop a new skill set really overnight. And I, and felt a bit like I was a fish out of water. Um, and if you do any kind of searching on the internet, you'll find that other people share uh, the, the sentiment sometimes with me that people management is actually a really hard job. Um, some people will say things like this, that being a manager sucks. And some people will say something even worse, like they hate being a people manager. And I laugh pretty hard at this because this person's only given it 16 days worth of a try. So I have a theory about why this is, why it's so difficult for some folks. And it's really because our expectations and reality are a bit out of alignment. And I think this was the case for me. Um, I think as humans, we tend to have very high expectations of ourselves, but we also have high expectations of a situation. Um, and so when those expectations are misaligned with the realities of a change, we kind of end up in this area of disappointment. 
And I think if we can be a little bit more transparent with what the expectations are and kind of be more forthcoming with people who might be thinking of going into people management, we can hopefully end up in the happiness quadrant, if not at least on that line and just have some contentment with this transition. So the first, um, I want to go through next uh, some of the expectations that I think I had and what I've heard from other people that I've spoken to. So the first one is that I'll get training. Um, and this wasn't further from the truth for me. Um, I did find a study from 2016 that interviewed a bunch of middle managers and found that 87% of managers wish they had more training before they became a people manager. Uh, many companies, in my mine included, and many of the companies I worked at since don't offer any formal people management skills training. Uh, and so you're, that means you're gonna have to learn on the job. You're probably gonna start this role and then really be learning these skills as you go which can be pretty uncomfortable. Um, I think the other thing is like taking that on and needing to teach yourself is something that you sort of have to, you know, work on. The other big one is that I think some people expect that a, uh, becoming a people manager is a promotion. And while for, in my case, I did go from a manager to a director role and that for all intents and purposes is a promotion. Um, it's really more of a job change. And I think reframing that in our minds is, is really an important thing to do because in most cases, a promotion means that you just get more responsibility and your job might become a little bit harder. Um, in the case of uh, becoming transitioning from IC to people manager, you're actually changing your day-to-day -day job. And the things that you do for hours a day will be different than what they were before. The next one is I'll deliver value and get recognition in the same way. And so your primary value is no longer going to be what you deliver or what you do, but it'll be what you help your team to do. And so as a manager, if, uh, if your main job is now to support other people to get their work done, what do you actually get to take credit for? So there's kind of that transition that, you know, if you really take a lot of pride in your work and the delivery of your work, you're going to have to kind of reframe that for yourself. Uh, next, next big one is I like working with people. So managing people should be easy. Um, this one is also, you know, I think people, a lot of people, people will, I was a people person and I still am, but um, I think what we don't, what maybe people don't realize is that you actually do kind of enter into this power dynamic when you become someone's manager and whether or not, you know, you want to be somebody's best friend still, or um, you want to be really close with those individuals. There's just this inherent thing built into that relationship now where, you know, you have the ability to fire that person or promote them or give them uh, a, a salary bump. So there's just uh, more inherent higher stakes built into that. Um, you're going to have to deal with personal issues, difficult conversations, uh, physical and mental health issues, probably. And, you know, you're probably at some point going to have to fire or lay somebody off. Um, and those things are never pleasant. And then lastly, uh, I'll receive feedback to help me improve. And while you probably still will receive feedback, what you're going to find is that the more senior you get, um, it's harder and harder to get useful and constructive feedback than it was when you were an IC. Um, again, this kind of comes into that power dynamics is that even if you're, you know, being a really bad manager, you're annoying your direct reports, sometimes they probably won't say anything because they're, they might be uh, untrustworthy or you might not have developed that relationship yet. And so you'll have to work really hard on developing trust and asking for feedback a lot of a lot and asking in a lot of different ways um, before you actually start getting this um, consistently. So I hope I haven't scared anyone off the path because that wasn't my intention. What I'm trying to do is help ground us in reality. But if you are still thinking, you know, I, I think I do want to become a people manager and I would encourage people to think of this. Um, I next want to talk about how you might think about choosing a path. So um, the first thing I want to say is taking a step back to reflect is really important. So a lot of times I think we kind of just like move head first through a career sometimes. And I think just taking this time to reflect on what is what really motivates you at work? Or what are your values and what does work mean to you? And will you be able to kind of change your value proposition if you move from being an IC to a people manager? And will that make you happy? And I think even broader than that, think about what your long-term goals are for the next five to 10 years. Like if you want to be a C-level at a company, you're not going to get there without being a people manager because that is just inherently a people manager path. Um, you can then, once you've done some reflection, you can go through and do a pros and cons list for yourself. So this is a, just a very high level example, but think about some of the things that, you know, you, you like to do that you get to keep doing. Think about some of the things that, you know, you, you might miss out on if you don't move out of the IC role and then do the flip side for people management. So, you know, people management can be very fulfilling for helping to grow and reach other people's goals, but, you know, maybe you risk burning out because the expectations are higher. You have expectations from your leadership, but also from your team now. And those might be out of alignment. 
And then here's a set of quick questions to ask yourself. So are you happy when you can help others grow and succeed? Do you enjoy talking to people, listening to their problems and resolving conflicts? Are you comfortable giving feedback and having difficult conversations? And will you be willing to help people manage through difficult personal life situations? So something like a death in the family or mental, physical health challenges, or even a divorce. And if you answer like these things make you cringe, um, it's really good to take a step back and think about it because um, these are going to be things that you're going to have to deal with as a people manager. Um, so definitely good to, to kind of think about that. And if you're still not sure, um, a couple of resources to help you out. Uh, if you've ever heard of a manager apprenticeship, this is something that I've picked up on recently from a few companies in Toronto that are trying this, where they offer people the ability to move into a management role for a six month trial period. And they actually do support with some training during that time. And at the end of the six months, that person can decide, do I want to stay in this role or do I want to go back to my IC role? Um, so that's probably really rare. But I think if we can start asking our companies to do this and start pushing for this, we might see more of this happening. Um, another really great thing to check out here is something called the Engineering Pendulum. This is a blog post. Um, if you look up charity, WTF is the name of the blog. Um, but this is a really great article that a lot of engineers um, and I think data folks can benefit from reading. It really just talks about how just because you become a people manager doesn't mean you have to stay in that role forever. You can kind of swing back and forth and sort of practice the different skill sets in different roles at different times in your career. Um, and I think I'm a perfect example of this. I just spent the last five years being a people manager and in my new role at Sakota, I'm now an individual contributor again. Um, and I have intentions to, to become a people manager again in the future. Um, and then just really some quick pieces of advice for making the transition. So uh, go easy on yourself. This is, it can be really difficult and you're going to make mistakes. I can guarantee it. Um, and you just have to be gracious with yourself. It's not really like, um, you know, just upskilling yourself in, in the ways that you have in the past. It's really learning some brand new skills and they're soft skills for the most part, which sometimes are harder to pick up. Um, make sure that you invest time in upskilling yourself and don't expect that your company is going to train you. Like this is something that you really do need to invest if you want to become better at it. Um, try to prepare early. So think about, you know, are there books that I should read or things that I should be doing before I take this role on? Because that's just going to help you make that transition. Um, make sure that you ground your expectations in reality so that you don't end up in that area of disappointment. Look for opportunities to try it. So ask your company, maybe they'll do that apprenticeship or you can try some informal mentoring or coaching. And then lastly, don't be afraid to ask for help from both your manager and also your team. So if you do become a people manager and you're struggling, you, like make sure that you ask for help because people should be there to help you. Um, some good resources that I'll share really quickly. The Effective Manager I found was a really, really helpful book. It's a very tactical look at what are the things I'm responsible for as a manager and like how do I run a one-on-one? -on -one? How do I give feedback? How do I delegate work and how do I coach my team? And so they, they kind of feel like a lot of these management books are uh, based in theory, and I felt that way as well. Um, the effective manager is really just, here is how you be a manager, and here are the steps you need to take. And so it's very tactical and easy to, to implement. Uh, manager Tools is a podcast that's run by the, the team who wrote the Effective Manager book. So they have thousands and thousands of episodes. They've been doing the podcast for, I think, 15 years. Um, so really recommend checking that one out. And then this book is a bit more theoretical, but how to win friends and influence people. Uh, it's actually a really old book, but I find this can kind of help people to understand, you know, your intention. And sometimes if your behavior is not in alignment, it can help you to kind of understand how to build trust with your team a bit better. So that was it. I know I went through that really quickly. So happy to answer any questions if anyone has any. Thank you. Awesome, Lindsay. Thanks so much for sharing and, and being so candid. I, I think it's one of the things that, you know, as a people manager, we, we often shy away from is, you know, there are really difficult conversations and oftentimes you sort of get put in the deep end. You can be a really strong individual contributor, but then when now you're leading a group, it, it, it's a completely different experience. So I, I really appreciate the insights there. Yeah. Okay. We did have a question coming in from the audience. So I think you touched upon it a little bit at the end, but you know, as an experienced manager now, like how do you continue upskilling and improving um, you know, from a management perspective besides maybe reading books and the podcasts? Um, are there any other techniques you do to sort of um, you, you know, check your behavior and see, okay, am I following the right path or reflecting and, and being, um, being really targeted there? 
Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think I think one of the things that, and this might be even just more general feedback as you get more senior in your career, is the, the networking piece. So um, I think going out and finding individuals who are at your same level, who are challenged with the same things, can really be helpful because you can kind of bounce ideas. They can share other resources that they've found helpful. Um, so that's one of the big things that I think I've leaned into a lot more recently is just sort of figuring out how to get out there and, and get to know more people who are challenged with the same things. And, and then you're able to sort of say like, hey, here's the situation I'm in. What did you do in a similar situation? Um, and finding mentors that might be able to help you out would probably be my biggest recommendation. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. I was uh, I was lucky enough to have a mentor early mm -hmm. on in my career and they really helped with transitioning from, you know, I was a marketer before getting into the, the recruitment business. So they were able to help with that transition. But even now, um, you know, as a business owner, I, I often will speak to a couple of mentors or, you know, the unofficial board and seeing if mm -hmm. we're working in the right direction or not. So I think, you know, for young people getting involved in their career, finding that mentorship is, is probably the, the most important thing that they can do. Yeah, for sure. Sometimes like a five minute conversation can have more impact on you than taking all the courses in the world. So <laughs> <laughs> I, could, I couldn't agree more. Um, well, I think that's pretty much it for questions. Honestly, thanks so much for the great presentation. I, I you know, even I was jotting down notes and I, I'm excited to jump into those podcasts. So thanks a lot, Lindsay. And uh, we'll see you hopefully at the next uh, modern, modern data tech stack <laughs> event. <laughs> yeah, awesome. Thanks so much for having me. Thanks, everyone. Perfect. Yeah, we're not quite there <laughs> yet. We got Anthony as well. Sorry about that. I, I moved off stage, but just as a quick introduction of Anthony. So he is, um, you know, currently the director of business intelligence at Paystone out in London, Ontario. They're one of the most exciting fintech companies here in the greater Toronto area. Prior to that, he was working for 3M, which, um, you know, is one of the, the big manufacturing companies globally and has a degree a master's degree in international finance. So um, thanks so much for joining us here today, Anthony. I, I, I really appreciate that. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's going to be fun. And a great speaker so far. I love it. Yeah, so far, so good. It, you know, puts a lot of pressure for us at the end uh, <laughs> on the fireside chat. But I guess in terms of my first question, something struck me, um, you know, what Lindsay was saying a little bit earlier. Now, to, to maybe date myself a little bit, I graduated sort of university around the same time of you in the late 2000s, early 2010s. And, you know, there wasn't a job that was called a data analyst or data scientist. You, you become a business analyst maybe or a statistician, but you didn't really have that term data scientist. So I think what happened was a lot of people began moving into the data field that were coming from other specialisms or other areas of, of focus. Um, you know, I was sort of hoping you could share a bit about your early career journey and how those maybe non-data roles prepared you for your current position at, at Paystone. Sure. So, yeah, it's, it's a really good point. I remember when I first started in the data field, first of all, I was never supposed to be in data. It was a complete accident. Uh, but the reason I ended up joining it is um, my plan was to go into banking. I was supposed to go into investment banking and I moved to Canada from Ireland uh, with my financial baggage and all of that. And I was looking for a job. So I, I got in touch with a recruiter and then that recruiter said, hey, you know what? That's the power of recruitment, right? And you got to get in touch with them. They will. Uh, they landed me a job at 3M as a data analyst and it was horrible. Like the first two weeks on that job, I was like, what am I doing? And then I discovered SQL and it was life changing. I was like, oh my God, this is, this is amazing. This brain, this fingers, SQL, we can do a lot together. And that was, that was it for me. I started uh, leveraging a lot of the skills I learned in, um, in, my, uh, in my master's degrees and my undergrad because it's all econometrics, right? It's all stats. It's basically numbers, numbers, numbers. It's the same thing, whether it's in economics or it's in data science. It's the, at the, fun, the fundamentals are the same, right? Uh, the methodologies might change eventually. You, you obviously you need to be to be a more solid programmer and all of that, but it was transferable skills that I was easily uh, able to implement in my uh, in my role at 3M. So the way it went for me is I started off as a data analyst, uh, doing very mundane tasks, and then I proved myself uh, by automating a lot of these tasks. And then I went into visit as I went in as a business insights analyst, and what that is is basically a combination of data 
uh, data analytics and business analytics combined. And it ended up being a whole bunch of storytelling, right? So you need to have that ability to convert very complex data models or sorry, data, like statistical models and communicate them to a non-technical audience. So I found myself pretty good at that. And um, that took me to the next level. Eventually, 3M was like, hey, there's an opportunity for you to go into marketing. <laughs> I did that for a year and a half, hated my life. It wasn't for me. However, the lesson there is that I learned a lot about uh, the business world. So I took that to, with two paystone, I, and then I, uh, my career just exploded from there. So uh, the idea here is that what you learn in your previous job or previous whatever your background is, you, there, there will always be something you can take with you into the data world. There's always something. Like a lot of people think that data is like super technical, but you, you need a lot of soft skills, like a lot of soft skills for you to, to, to succeed in this role. And uh, like I said, some, some of the soft skills is just being able to communicate and be a good storyteller. Without that, you will not succeed. Right? Like I've seen some of the best data scientists go down in, flame, in flames because they couldn't uh, communicate their findings really well. Um, so that's, that's, kind of, uh, that, you know, that's kind of my thought on that. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, it, it, do, it does actually. I, I, and it sort of leads me into my next question, right? Like, you know, you've, you've got a team at Paystone, you hire a lot of people coming into the data field. Some maybe come from a pure, data science background, now there's degrees in it, right? So we, we, we can become uh, really uh, data specialized right from the, an early early start of your career. But you know, how do people, when they meet with you, maybe for a job interview, how do they best highlight their cross-functional skills? Or like, what do you sort of look to hear when, when people are mm -hmm. maybe transitioning in, into a, a role with it, within the data field? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. So, if it's somebody coming from a data field into the data field, that's a pretty straightforward thing. Like I, I know exactly what to look for. But if it's somebody who's not from the data field uh, or is from a similar role, let's say they were a software engineer, for example, that's a, that's a bit more straightforward because they have those technical skills. But if it's somebody, for example, from a chemical engineering background, well, I saw that at 3M, one of the best data leaders at 3M right now joined my team at the same time as, as I did. And that person came from a chemical engineering background. One, the, the one thing we look for is industry fit. So that person came from oil and gas. And the role we were hiring for was for a business insights analyst in the oil and gas industry. So that was like a huge check mark. We're like, oh, yeah, that's, that's, that's our guy. 100% we're hiring that person. The other big thing we saw was that that person was an excellent problem solver. That, that is the big thing in data analytics. You need to be an excellent problem solver. You need to find quick solutions. You need to be, uh, you, you need to be smart about it. And then um, the other big thing we, uh, I look for when I'm hiring somebody is, have they displayed or have they proven that they are good at data analytics? And there are multiple avenues you can go down to, you know, to, to make that visible. And one of them is as simple as creating a GitHub repository just to display your work. So the last person I hired, hired I had, him, had an amazing GitHub. Uh, she displayed all of her work in there. I was like, oh, great, clean code. I see, I, like I saw her logical process or you know, her thought process and all of that. And uh, that, that's one avenue. Another avenue, and this, this was somebody I interviewed, um, that person was out of Lebanon actually. Uh, he, he had, I think he ranked number one on Hacker Rank on SQL. So like that right there, I'm like, yeah, that's, 100%. I'm going. I'm going for this person. 100%. There's no no doubt. My, my, you're ranking number one on Hacker Rank. That's huge. So um, so so needless. Obviously, he didn't take the job because uh, <laughs> the time he's ranked number one. <laughs> <laughs> number one. You, you're not ranked number one. <laughs> uh. <laughs> Uh, but that's kind of the idea. Like those things will make you really stand out. And uh, look, it's, it's not really difficult. I mean, uh, it, there are so many different avenues. Like some people ask me, okay, so what kind of data sets can I use? Well, there's a lot out there. You can go to Kaggle. You can get a whole bunch of data out there. You know, the Titanic uh, the data. Use that. Experiment on it. And just show that you know what you, you know what you're doing with the data, and you know what you can, how to communicate that data. Um, actually, I'll tell you a little story. One of the best interviews I had. <clears throat> a few years ago, I interviewed with this one company. I, I obviously did not take the job just because I, I, was, 
I just didn't want to do it. But uh, they asked me to do a little case study. I added a whole bunch of stuff into the case study that had nothing to do with what they asked for. So I just went way above and beyond just to display my skill set. And they were like, awesome, this is great. We love, we would love to work with you. The stuff you displayed here shows that you're a good fit. So uh, it's just like, just go above and beyond, display your work and uh, just show that you're relevant in that industry. I'll give you one last example of, um, you know, a thing I touched on in the, at the beginning, which is uh, industry fit. Uh, somebody on my team uh, recently left and uh, he, he was a data analyst. He is going into a pharmaceutical company as a data analyst as well, but he got in so easily because he comes, he's currently doing his uh, major in biology and he's a great data analyst. So like that, that's like a very easy fit. Like the guy just went in, that was too, super easy for him to do, to do that. So um, yeah, those, those are my points on that, on that topic there. You know, and I, I couldn't agree more as, as someone who uh, looks for jobs for people's professionally that that's probably the thing that we look for as a big key right it's, it's not just the skill sets that you have and you can do the job but do you have that domain experience right like you know if you're in fintech companies right now you're probably going to be a really good fit for another fintech firm because you understand the regulations the challenges have a completely different lens on on what maybe the the other company is doing and you can provide a lot of value there. I, I find it's a lot harder if, if you start from, let's say, a fintech company and then try and move into, you, you know, automotive industry or in, in one of the, like a marketing firm, right? It, it does make it a lot harder. Um, earlier, you know, Lindsay provided great presentations on the challenges of becoming a people manager. I, uh, I always like to now stop and, and ask you, you know, how did you make the transition and what were some of the lessons you learned to becoming a people manager? It, it was insane. It was just completely brutal. Like, uh, like Lindsay said, nobody told me that I was, this is what I was going to expect. Cause like she said, I, I, like Lindsay said, I guess, um, I thought it was a promotion. It was like, <laughs> This is what it feels like. You've got your team, there's you, and there is upper management. You're literally a quarterback, right? You're stuck in the middle of that sandwich and it is absolutely brutal sometimes, but it's also super rewarding. Like there's no doubt about it. It's, uh, it's super rewarding when you see people succeed, when you see your, uh, people you've mentored uh, grow and it, it's awesome. Uh, but you're tapping into a skill set that you never thought you had. Like I was not expecting any of this. So. I started off super technical data engineering was like, I'm not going to say top notch data engineering, but there was a lot. I was considering myself an okay data engineer, super te technical. But when I got into this role, I'm like, holy moly, I need to tap into my EQ, EQ skills. I need to figure out like, what's the team dynamic here? How does this person play with that person? How are the stakeholders interacting with my team? At one point, at one point, it got, it got so overwhelming. I reached out to a good friend of mine who has, who has led loads of teams globally. And I was like, hey, buddy, like, I, I just need a coffee with you. And uh, he gave me some super simple tips. Like what, one of the tips, for example, he's like, OK, how do you provide feedback? And I noticed that my after talking to him, I noticed that my feedback was absolutely like, I'm not going to say terrible. It's just like not super constructive. And the language I was using was probably not the best. So he said something like, OK, so instead of saying, why did you do this? ask what made you choose this path right like it's just a, i just swapped two words and i know this oh oh my god this is awesome like you it's a you're getting a completely different different response and then the other thing and lindsay and lindsay said it said that as well is like nobody's going to give you feedback unless you ask for it and sometimes even when you do ask for it it becomes a bit it's a bit of a uh, you know people are not going to be 100 percent honest because they feel like their jobs it's uh, you know what i'm gonna i'm not gonna tell my boss he sucks but, right, like nobody's gonna say that. But I, I had to force one of my team members. It took me like four months of doing this for her to get comfortable in giving me that feedback. Right, like Anthony, you, you messed up here. You shouldn't have. You, maybe you should have taken a different approach, so on and so forth. So now we have that trust built, and uh, things, you know, things are flowing a, a lot better. But it took me, it took me a while to get to that point. Like it, it wasn't easy. Like I wish, I wish my company provided uh, training. <laughs> Yeah, you know, I, I couldn't agree more. I think the use of language is is really key because, and, and and being appropriate with it, sometimes it's it's really hard, especially if you're giving as 
you know, negative feedback or, you know, if you have to have a difficult conversation with someone, it, it's a natural instinct to try and protect that person's feelings, right? Because mm -hmm. the reality is a manager, you, you probably care for most of the people on your team and you want them to be successful. So it's about choosing that language and, and really making the appropriate choices of, of wording, I, I find as well, like yeah. everybody learns a little bit differently, right? So if you think about learning styles of, of people, some people are more doers, other people want to have the full breakdown of why they're doing something. So it's it's also trying to maybe be a little bit of a chameleon yourself where you're you're sort of pairing your managing style to their learning styles as well, I find. Yeah. There's, there's also one last point in this one. It's, this one's pretty important for you know every every manager out there, I guess. I've seen people go into management and just completely lose touch of uh, the industry, right? So they get caught up in managing that they forget about the innovations that are happening in the in the industry. Uh, I think both presenters talked about how quickly the uh, the industry is moving. Like it's moving so so fast. So at Paystone, we have this, I'm not going to call it a rule. It's more like an unwritten rule for directors that you spend uh, anywhere between 30 to 50% of your time coding, and then the rest is managing. I know it sounds like overkill, but how am I going to manage a team, coach a team, and coach somebody's career if I've lost touch of the innovations that are happening in the market? Like just yesterday or two days ago, um, maybe it's more than two days. I, I just I started reading up about it recently. Um, Pandas has a huge competition with Polars now, which is a new uh, uh, Python library. If I'm not coding, I wouldn't know about this and I wouldn't know the intricacies about it. So if you want to be a really good data leader, you have to be good technically and you have to keep maintain that strong, like it's just like a, like a coach, like a whatever, a tennis coach. A tennis coach has to be really good. Right, you're not going to have a tennis coach that obviously they're not going to compete, but they still need to be really good. They still still need to, to, to know how to serve. Okay, I'm going a little bit off script on my questions, but one of the the big challenges, especially when I speak with directors and and you know having that hands-on code, is these new features will come out, right? So a new Python library or new ways of doing things for your for your for your coding side, but people will look at them, they'll read the the update, and then they'll just go back to what they were doing before. How, how do you ensure that the best new practices are being integrated into your your your, your data libraries and your, and your data code stack? Put you on the spot there, Anthony. No, no, no it's all good. <laughs> we, we, so I actually asked one of my team members uh, today, just like d dive into Polars because it's way faster and then just go with it. Like my, my team is all about efficiencies. That's that's what we drive, efficiencies left, right, and center. And so far, Polars is looking like it's significantly faster than Pandas. But like, if it means we have to change it, we change it. We change to, to Polars. That's the way we do it. Um, what's, what's another example? I mean, you're looking at, we don't want to stay stagnant. We've tried that in the past and it's been, it was horrible. Uh, the industry is moving really quick. I just signed up for, for Sakoda. So, uh, Lindsay, I, as we're doing this, I signed up for it. I'm like, oh my God, this is amazing, right? Tomorrow, what's going to happen is I'm going to take this, give it to my team, play around with it, evaluate it. If it's great, let's let's dive into it and throw it in, into our tech stack. Um, you have to keep moving with the industry. Otherwise, you're, you're going to fall behind. There's like, you're going to fall behind. There's no way about it. So for the sake of our business, that's uh, that's the way we're, we, we do things. It's like awesome. Make it mandatory. All right. Yeah. And I think just like last last question on for me, you know, for those who are aspiring people leaders looking about setting up a data team for themselves, you know, how did you set up your, your data team at Paystone and, and why did you do it in that manner? Yeah, sure. So that's a good question. Um, the way I set up the team at the beginning is not the way it is today. Uh, the team, the team structure evolved as the company grew and scaled. So. And this would, this would probably does not apply to large uh, large companies like uh, Sanofi or 3M, for example. This is more geared towards uh, startups and uh, mid-market companies. Um, when we first started, it was basically me and one other person. We did not have the luxury of um, assigning one of us to a, to a division, for example, a pro or a product line. Uh, the way we worked is we did everything. It was a centralized team. So uh, we had a ticketing system. People would submit tickets, and then both of us would, would, tackle, uh, would tackle the tickets as uh, based on priority. 
Now, as the company grew and we acquired more companies and we got way more funding, uh, we we obviously hired more more people on my team, and then we had the luxury of creating pods, right? And those pods were basically you had one person assigned to sales and marketing and partnerships, you had one person assigned to product, you had another, which is me basically, and then you had uh, others assigned to to finance and operations, for example, and then you had data engineers who were assigned to uh, who were split between two different uh, products uh, or pods, call it. The trade off and the benefits of uh, both st structures is that in the centralized team, like when we first started off, it was awesome because we touched everything. Like we touched finance, we touched, we did all kinds of exciting projects. Uh, I remember one of the most notable projects, and this one was super exciting, was figuring out the distance between our customers and certain warehouses that uh, that are used for servicing the accounts. Like I would not do that today because I am not assigned to the operations division, right? However, back in the day, I was like, this, this, was, this was really cool. It was really cool stuff. Um, so you had a very broad perspective in, in that kind of team. But now in the pods, you have a more narrow view, but it's a lot deeper. So you understand, like you, you would understand finance very, 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 very deeply. Like it's not like a, a centralized team where, you know, you just needed to understand monthly recurring revenue as a, in today's world, you understand every aspect of monthly recurring revenue. You understand uh, how credits and debits work in that uh, in that equation, for example. You, like we're talking about minute details, and you're expected to know that. So that, that's kind of the trade-off. You you know, you're an expert versus a generalist uh, in these two uh, in these two you know worlds, I guess. Awesome. Well, I think that's pretty much where we're coming up to the uh, just a little bit over that hour right now. But, you know, we really appreciate your time today, Anthony. It was uh, it was awesome having you here and, and I appreciate you, um, you know, taking time for the fireside chat. So thanks so much. And um, yeah, I'll, I'll probably bring you off stage, <laughs> stage now, but I really appreciate you taking the time to do this. today. Yeah, no, thank you. And uh, likewise, you know, I think overall a big thank you to all of our speakers, uh, Shariahs, Lindsay, Anthony, you know, did, uh, you know, really shared some great information, some insights, and I hope everyone got a little bit of value from that um, throughout today. You know, just as one more quick reminder at the end, we've got our next event coming up at uh, on June 29th, um, you know, Women in Tech panel. So, you know, Great speakers from Google, One Password, Ada. We're really looking forward to having them on on the panel. And um, you know, till next time, thank you so much, and have a great rest of the day.